Welcome. In this video, I would like to talk about multicollinearity and what issues can result from that. This topic is closely linked to our last video where we have already discussed about some of the properties of the ordinary least squares estimator. And we have already found out that the data which are used in order to solve the OLS can have a significant impact in terms of the accuracy and certainty certainty regarding the found parameters. For the multicollinearity discussion, I would like to basically start with a practical example to make it more vivid. In this example, I would like to identify uh, a system with two inputs, U1 and U2, which I can basically um, choose. So I can excite the system inputs um, and I'm observing the output of the system Y. And of course, there's again some additive measurement noise as we have already um, assumed previously. The true model uh, setup I would like to identify is a very simple um, polynomial expression with some parameters a1, a2, a3, a4. And we have as the regressors basically u1 times a1 plus u2 times a2, a3 times u1 square and u4, uh, u2 times a4. So just four regressors, four parameters, and we would like to identify that. So I can, of course, rewrite this equation again in our usual regressor parameter form. And this would be then yk would be u1, k, u2, k u1 square k u2 square k and as a parameter vector a1 a2 a3 a4 right so this is basically the same expression as we have here this is again our parameter vector and this is our regressor vector for one measurement point. So what I would like to emphasize here with this like little restructuring is that depending on how we choose u1 and u2, so these are the inputs to our system, we can choose them freely, let's say, we will define different regressor math matrices or regressor vector contents, which can lead to different regressor matrices. And I would like to discuss a specific suboptimal representation, let's say, on how we could choose the regressors, so the inputs. And let's say we want to write u2 over u1. And let's say somebody wants to excite the system in a linear correlated way. So let's say we are choosing to put in u1 and u2 in a mostly in a mostly linear fashion right so this would be like our u1s and u2s which we add to our system which we put inside here then we observe y and based on that we would fill up our normal equations for the ordinary least squares and solve that right so we would have roughly a linear relation between u1 and u2 and as an edge case, we actually want to calculate via hand what would happen if there would be actually an ideal linear uh, relation between u1 and u2. So let's say that, that u2 would be some inclined better times u1, right? So that would be an ideal uh, relation, ideal linear relation between u1 and u2, and better would be just some scaling parameter. If we would do this, so if somebody would excite the system using such a strategy so that there is always a certain linear relation between u1 and u2, what we would get from inserting it there with dropping k, uh, the, the measurement uh, point number for uh, sake of brevity, we, could, we get uh, y1 is equal to u1 times a1 plus beta times a2 
if we just insert this here or here, plus u1 square times a3 plus beta times a4. And what we can see from this edge case already is that due to this perfect linear relation, we basically have reduced our initial problem, which had like four regressors and four unknown parameters, to a problem where I have only two regressors, u1 and u1 square, but we still have four parameters, right? So we have a1, a2, a3, and a4, which we would like to investigate, which we would like to identify. And it seems that we have some kind of a problem here because if we if we just look in this parenthesis, we could find many combinations between A1 and A2 giving some better, which will basically lead to the same result. Same here. So in other words, we have lost the capability to make a difference in the identification process that certain impacts on the model response come from a certain change in A1 or a certain change in A2. So we are not able to distinguish between the parameters A1 and A2. Formally, if we take this equation and do our, um, and take many measurements, so let's take y1 to yn, is equal to our usual regressor matrix, u1, 1, beta u1, u1 square, 1, and beta u square, 1, up to u1n, Beta u1 n u1 square n and beta u1 square n. So that's a little bit too large. Times w our parameter vector. So this here is our regressor matrix. That as usual. And what we can find out from this if we multiply this column here, right? If we multiply this column times better, we get the next column, or if you do the same here, so if we multiply it with better, we would get the fourth column. So in other words, these two lines, or these two columns, are linear dependent with each other, ideally linear dependent, right? So that would mean that the rank of this big matrix can be as most as two because these are from the four columns we have, only two are linear dependent from each other or at most depending on how we choose the data. But in the best case, the rank of that therefore is two and therefore the rank of that transpose times z is also 2, and that is smaller than 4, which we would need in order to solve our uh, standard problem, w hat is z transpose times z inverse times z transpose times y. Right here, to calculate this inverse, we would need to ensure that the rank of z transpose z is full, which is not the case if we have this ideal linear correlation between these two inputs to our system, right? So in this edge case, which I have sketched here, where we have perfect linearity uh, between the two inputs, we would even not able to calculate this result because this inverse would not exist because the rank of z transpose that is not full and therefore we cannot calculate the inverse at all. And this is of course the edge case of multicollinearity where multiple regressors, multiple input data are highly correlated with each other. However, if there would be like some smaller deviation or maybe even some noise on the inputs as depicted here, 
Of course, we would not have this perfect linearity, but we would have a certain degree of linearity. In other words, we would have a certain degree of collinearity between the inputs. And I would like to study this also with some code example. So what we did here in this code example is actually we uh, set up uh, some parameters. So these A1, A2, A3, A4 for the very same problem. And then what we do here is basically we solve or we set up our ordinary least squares problem for a certain amount of noise. So the noise level at the output here is constant. And the only thing actually which we, which we change here at that point is how the relation between U1 and U2 at the input of the system is, right? So what we actually do is we assume a certain linearity between u1 and u2, as you can also see here up in the code. But for looping over it for this animation loop, we will add different levels of noise. At the beginning, we will have just a very small amount of noise. And then over time, we will add more noise to our input, so that means that this ideal linear correlation between u1 and u2 is broken up and we will have a richer excitation of this input space, right? So this is basically this looping over this noise on the relation between u1 and u2. That is not an in, that's not the measurement noise here, but this, this is basically the noise to spread up the excitation between u1 and u2. If we then show the result of this identification then as you can see here at the very beginning we assume that this relation between u1 and u2 is again more or less ideally linear and then we see over time we add noise to the relation between u1 and u2 and therefore we basically enrich this um, excitation we enrich the input space in terms of information what we can see here in the title is basically the relative parameter error. So how well are we able to identify our parameters A1 to A4? And what we can see here in this area, also with the residual plots, is the error of the model prediction. So if I just identify uh, the model and then predict y hat is uh, z times v Hat, right, so our model prediction, and we compare this through the ground truth data. And what we can see from this animation is basically two observations. The first observation is that even for small amounts of, of noise on this input area, so very linearly dependent input data, we can see here that the error in terms of the uh, model accuracy, the prediction accuracy, is quite good. It seems to be more or less unaffected or just marginally uh, affected by the data distribution. So even if the data is more or less linearly dependent in the input space, the model prediction seems to be okayish, because the error here is more or less constant, more or less, independently from how I structure my input data. On the other side, here in the top is the relative parameter error. So comparing w hat against the true w. And here you can see that at the beginning where we have this more or less ideal linear relation between u1 and u2 in the input space, that this error is very large. So we can see that we have problems due to the multicollinearity to find the true w but still, although we are not able to distinguish which parameter has which impact on, on the model predictions, we are still able to come up with accurate model predictions, right? So interesting, somehow, um, uh, different viewpoints here or different results in terms of accuracy regarding the parameters and accuracy regarding the model predictions. In another experiment, same model, same uh, system, what we would like to investigate here. Uh, what we did here is basically we uh, structured the data again with different levels of spreading of U1 between U2. And what we did from this 
is we did an analysis on the condition of Z transpose times Z, right? So we looked basically at the condition, the condition of Z transpose times Z from the spreading. And the condition of the square matrix is basically the relation between the largest and the smallest eigenvalue. And the larger this condition number is, the worse it is to calculate the invert in terms of numerical algorithms. And the condition would basically go to infinity if we have this perfect linearity, right? So therefore, this x-axis is basically a measure of how well I'm able to calculate this inverse numerically. Here on the right-hand side, where the condition number gets very large, uh, this is uh, very poor, so it's more or less nearly singular. Um, and on the other side, if the condition number is very low, that means that the data in terms of the numerics inside here seems to be not so collinear and it seems to be easily invertible from a numerical standpoint. And interestingly, we have defined this diagram here in a double logarithmic fashion. We can find that the um, condition of this data matrix seems to be logarithmically, uh, lin uh, logarithmically associated with the model parameter accuracy, right? So the better this condition number, so the smaller the condition number is, the better I'm able to identify the uh, parameters. So therefore, the condition number of Z transpose times Z can help us to at least identify severe cases of multicollinearity, or in simplified words, the case where the data input space, which is mapped here on the regressor matrix, is not suitable to make distinctions on the different parameters and their impacts on the model. Okay, so that's uh, it's on multicollinearity. It's also a topic on the data quality, which we see. Um, and we will, in the next video, see a practical tool which can try to mitigate uh, problems which arise from heavy multicollinearity by a little trick within the ordinary least squares problem formulation. Thank you for listening and see you in the next video.